on evolution of organizer and the influence of vertebrate biology on the evolution and due disturbance in hemicodex. John. going up, I don't know, over the last eight years, and is sort of slowly fermenting, and uh, hasn't been written up really. I'm not quite sure how to write it up, because it's, it's really a survey here, and the conclusion we're going to come to at the end is that it looks as if Cyclobolosis has all the genes that would be expressed in the verb type organizer, but they're expressed in different organization they are all drawn together into something that looks like an organizer. Uh, they have many of the same patterning processes that we thought to take place in vertebrates through what the organizer provides. But again, it's, it's just that their initial organization, the way they're established in one part or the other, the embryo is different. So we're at some sort of level of organization of developmental processes here that is um, very far up the scale. Uh, so it would come out that if it were all simple and interesting here, why does it mean to indicate the Deuterstone ancestor already had a key chordate developmental trait like this, so it's sort of then leaned to the side that the Deuterstone ancestor, ancestor had this chordate character to it. So as I say, that won't be fulfilled in what I have to say here. Um, so, uh, of course, one has to go back to sort of the iconic organizer, which in modern days really comes from Xenophus, because that's where a lot of the molecular work was done um, and has built up over probably the last uh, two to three decades. And much of this, uh, and used to refer to this already, but these are the sorts of things then one would look for in cytoglossus to see if we're going to make some comparisons here. So first of all, <coughs> a part of this case, this would be an early gastrula stage of Xenopus, so this would be the blastiform lip. So we're just starting gastrulation here, and it's known from all these studies that there is this region over the so-called dorsal lip of the blastopore, where it, you have a lot of organization here, and various genes are expressed in various parts here. There's a red, pink, yellow, and we could even put a little green in here. And um, this is all, in blue sort of organizer region in here. And what's in there? Well, these are all friends to us. There would be such things as uh, cordon, ADMP, polystatin, noggin, uh, there's Fox A, SFRPs, Frisbee, Crescent, Dick Puff, and then we have various anti-wince, anti-BMPs, and we have a lot of, uh, there's hedgehog in there. But we have a lot of transcription factors as well expressed at particular places in here. So there'd be Brackenberry and not X not. There'd be Goose Koi, uh, Lim Homeo Box, other one, and the list goes on and on. And this a yellow region up here, which in, in the Universitas lab they, uh, was the most recent uh, addition to this. There'd be such things as uh, hex, which is something called H hex, not as X, but H hex in here. Uh, Cerberus blimp, I forgot to put on here, it's just up here. So there are a lot of things for which uh, play, time and place of expression are known. It's all over here in this lip, and this is part of the characterization of the organizer there. Uh, at the same time, there's the other side of the embryo, <clears throat> and in the end, it is important to know what's going on over there. Uh, BMP4. Uh, seven vents as transcription factors, MSX toloid protease, uh, toloid antagonist sizzle, uh, uh, 
uh, cross vanless twisted gas relation, pinhead ADMP2, like there's a Zenithus version, which is different from what you still mentioned mm -hmm. here uh, that we see in the Abdelkaria. Uh, Wince over there. So there are all sorts of things to know about because these are going to play off against each other during gas relation all the time that goes on. So um, then there's a lot of circuitry that's been worked out, and you still also mentioned some of this, and this is a diagram that sort of compresses everything. Blue meant to be more for transcriptional effects, and red for um, interactions of proteins for activations, inactivations. And it's, uh, it's quite a wonderful circuitry and quite complex. Uh, so those are things that one can look at as well to get indications. All important though, finally, in the pattern that is taking place during gas relation. Um, then at the same time, as, as <coughs> gas relation goes on, one needs to look sort of what happens at the end. So let's say if we take these regions here, this this head organizer pink region, which ends up very far forward here under what would be sort of the forebrain to midbrain portion of the, uh, uh, this is probably a neural tube rolled up in here. Um, so that those cells did a spreading migration, kind of crawling up the wall of the blast seal, and then finally came out under this region here, shown in blue, which is now this region there. And so that they have their special morphogenetic activity. But then here's this red region, which is eventually going to form the notochord and is well known for all the conversion extension activity there. And even though there is some conversion extension that takes place elsewhere around this region here, it's most extreme by far in this region right here, the red there. And then finally, that's going to differentiate as the notochord. This is at least a term. These yellow regions, this goes just to show you how. <laughs> gas relation goes. This is going all the way over to what would be the ventral region here. This is down near the heart and the liver here in the end. These are the bottle cells that re spread up here, and this is all around sort of the pharyngeal region up in here. So there's a lot to know about how things move and what it is that they are then releasing uh, in the patterning of uh, various parts of the embryo. So a lot to know about, and um, I'm not going to go through this, but it says that in this list, the sorts of things that you would look for is in the location of all these expressions. You organize here the two parts of the, the head and the trunk organizer portions are definitely in mesoderm. It's called mesoderm anyway, and in Xenophus here, so we'll have to refer back to that. But there are all these, the organizer acting as a real signaling center here, releasing, releasing these anti. BMPs and anti winds And it's also at the same time a big morphogenetic center here. So there's a lot going on as far as conversion and extension, all sorts of cell behaviors here that are um, sort of special to this, this region. All that goes on and accomplishes then dorsal ventral anterior posterior patterning during mastulation and intermerulation, uh, getting such things as neural induction and somite specification. And then finally, the notochord is giving us, for example, its differentiation uh, into the notochord. Um, so there'd be a lot to try to compare there. Uh, here's, here's sacroglossus. It definitely succeeded in getting dorsal, ventral, anterior, posterior organization. On the other hand, we know already from studies of protostomes uh, where no one talks about this kind of organizer there even though they do talk about, let's say, things like uh, BMP and uh, cord and light molecule playing off against each other in your posterior pattern in ways. Uh, it is possible to get such organization in a bilaterian without having a vertebra type organizer. So where are we as far as psychoplosis and all of this? So that would be the juvenile here. It's all wonderful. And there's the adult here. Also wonderful, but you've seen a lot of that. <laughs> and, um, um, this, this would go back to the old um, drawings in Bateson's paper, and this is some of what uh, Steve Green mentioned already, just I want to point out as we're going by here. We look at these early stages. One would want to know a lot about, let's say, the very early gastrula stages here, this being a flat plate, so the earliest stage here, and then through gastrulation, because 
it's in that period, as we're sort of getting through here, let's say down here, closing the blast core maybe into this, just as far as comparative times, uh, looking at gas relation, that we'd want to see what's going on in second losses versus what's going on in sentence, let's say. So here we are at this point, and one interesting dissimilarity is that you come through here, we've got blue for ectoderm in here, or we've got this region around here like this, We've got this yellow for perspective. This is just called endomesoderm at this point, as you see it uh, folding inside here like this. So there is a genesis going on here. But we haven't said anything about mesoderm. And as Stephen mentioned, it's only out of these stages where you start to see this most anterior portion for mesoderm, and then still later, things out here and then down and here as well. So mesoderms are rising fairly late. And so we're not in a position to think that already, let's say, there are mesodermal portions of organizer around here. We'd have to be talking about something endomesodermal, perhaps. So uh, there are already differences here where the chordates are way ahead than they're in, in specifying uh, mesoderm here. Okay, so there will be lots of in situ, but these are basically ones we don't have to look at too much, um, except to see our favorite organizer genes of where they are expressed at what times. So let's say uh, we come down here to Corden. Uh, this is, uh, this is uh, Chris did this some years ago with BMP on one side, Corden on the other. This would be the blast pore closed here. That would be anterior there where we have a, a dorsal midline here with a nice BMP expression on it. Uh, ventral midline with the Corden expression on it. Corden is interesting, and we've looked at this quite a bit at the early stages as you're, as you're getting to late blastula and getting into sort of flat plane, getting up toward gas weight. Corden is expressed all the way around, all the way around the equator. It's not down in one level region like it is in Xenopus uh, in, uh, in a dorsal lip sector, which is about 60, it's said to be about 60 to 90 degrees wide. Of the 360, just a patch of cordon in the case of Xenobus. But this is all the way around. And then in time, it is shrinking back here to one side, to its midline position. Uh, let's look at VNP24. So it's coming up. It's actually a little sluggish in getting going here. Uh, it does finally come up nicely there on this dorsal midline over here. It's picking up in this region. And here, uh, Xenopus is said to start out with a lot of maternal BMP message and it express a lot of BMP generally all around. And actually, in some early steps of organized formation, there are special steps to eliminate BMP from the region where the organizers form. So it's, it's quite different there. This doesn't seem to have any maternal BMP showing up here, and it's pretty clean through this and then it's sort of getting around to it, building it up here on this, off of this midline over here. Uh, here's, uh, as you should have said about the ADMP2, it's, it's nicely expressed, it's actually stronger <laughs> earlier the way it kicks in here. And so, uh, so it's quite beautiful actually here. And it's really on this, it's up there with, uh, just as you said, with BMP24 uh, there, on, right on the midline there. Uh, what else do we have? We have ADMP1, which um, is starting out here and is building up also slowly and getting over here to its position on the um, on the ventral midline here. It's almost all ectodermal here, um, rather than so. So we're not looking at we're not looking at mesodermal or endomesodermal expression here. We're looking at ectodermal expressions all the way through here, so we're not seeing germ layer uh, similarities to what would be the Xenobus there. We have one little spot in here in into the end of the end of mesoderm, but uh, most of the rest of it is really ectodermal. Um, not to stop with that, well, uh, in the case of Xenobus, noggin is organizer specific. But curiously, it's expressed here uh, it doesn't show up there, but it shows up in a little 
uh, what would be a dorsal posterior spot way here down by the closing blastopore like that. And there are little bits that you can last see there to identify where it is. That's completely different. Um, Follistatin is sort of generally up in the ectoderm here and a little into the endovisoderm anteriorly here. Uh, builds up uh, like this symmetrically. There's not a dorsal ventral uh, difference here to it. Um, this is a this is from the Cerberus, the family to which Cerberus belongs so all down here. It's just generally ectodermally expressed here, sort of anteriorly without a dorsal ventral difference to it. Um, then we can skip to because you just don't know what might be expressed in an organizer region or not as an anti BNP. These are other ones that are known. Uh, so here is a gremlin molecule which is, has, has been studied as a good BNP antagonist. It's expressed over on the dorsal midline, like that. Early, very, very nice stuff there. Here's neuralin, which in, um, is expressed later in um, vertebrate embryos and is an anti BNP. It's expressed also early here. It's also very nice in there. So we've got all of these things coming up early, all very sharply on this, uh, on this dorsal midline and ectodermal here. Pinhead, which uh, you should have mentioned, is also showing up here on the, this dorsal midline as an anti ADMP. And ADMP and so that midline is really loaded up with things. Uh, this is sort of a summary. Whereas down here on the ventral midline, we have our cordon and a DMP sort of lonely over there in the, in the uh, ectoderm. And we have up here loaded up all of these things, BMP and what seems to be a lot of anti-BMPs. It would be really hard to um, sort of guess the interactions and circuitry and distribution of um, let's say um, a BNP, free BNP itself, uh, or then suddenly finally getting down into transcription factors and phosphorylation and so on across here, you'd have to really make the measure of it, which we haven't done. But anyway, these are all built up on this side, ectodermally, this, this little bit is built up over here on this side. Now from, um, from uh, the 2003 paper that, uh, Chris um, was first, first author on, there were these very nice results. The conclusion from this, this is 2006, that basically uh, altering BMP levels uh, affects totally the dorsal ventral expression, just about everything that has any dorsal ventral asymmetry to it as far as gene expression goes. So uh, if, as you probably remember, uh, that if you have overexpression being types here where you just put BNP into the seawater for the embryos that develops, it finally comes out to be this really symmetric, thick-necked animal here, which turns out to really express dorsal midline genes uniformly around the entire animal here. And if you do a BNP knockdown, eliminating it, um, then you also get cylindrically symmetric animals, but of a, different, a very different type, where finally the, the neck narrows down and down and down, <clears throat> and the proboscis falls off here. And these things express what would be ventral midline genes everywhere around. And so um, he had checked a lot of those, and you see things that, for example, this little pit X spot up here, which is dorsal, here, and so in excessive BMP, that thing just becomes radially expressed around here, whereas this thing down here, which was on the ventral midline here, doesn't get expressed when there's a lot of BMP. It seems to be repressed there. And, and that sort of ran through a lot of things, and it's continued to run through it. Pax one's nice in the gill slip there. Here it's sort of running all the way around the this endoesoderm in here, this endoderm here. Um, it's quite, quite remarkable. So, so I think basically everything, one thing we've added to that is that if you knock out cordon, working from the other side, 
And BNP24 is expressed everywhere around, like that. This is kind of cylindric, a symmetric thing. The neural end, which I mentioned here, expressed on the north of the line, is all the way around. Here's pin X again, everywhere around. Um, and this thing, too, doesn't manage to form a mouth in here, uh, as it has all this excess BNP in the absence of, of uh, cord. A um, little bit of data here, which could, when <coughs> looked at more through a list from Bob Freeman, and there's more to come for this, he has a lot more data, uh, sort of shows interactions here, the sort of thing that was mentioned here. This would be uh, BNP siRNA, so for example, just quantifying amounts of, of messaging here, AD and P accordant are, are high. Um, so these are uh, ventral expressions high in the absence of BMP and low in excess BMP. Other things which BMP itself uh, would be low when there's knockdown, uh, high up here in, uh, when BMP is in excess. And uh, so things are fairly, I think, fairly well behaving in there. Um, we did check a little bit on on vent because that's something that in Xenopus is really associated with uh, BMP action. And um, there are two of the vents. I think that uh, Doreen Cunningham looked at these, and uh, but they're not expressed in in any way where we could have a dorsal and ventral difference. There, there are lots of spots. You might have some interest for. Neurogenesis early on. Uh, it's not something that we can couple to vent BMP association. Uh, there is something called, there's lots of different names, it's sort of a problem with psychoglossis. The genes have all kinds of different names. This one's called Vox Vent today, <laughs> and uh, it is expressed on one side, but we have yet to understand uh, more about it. Um, okay, so that was, that was it for the BMP and BMP antagonists. Uh, there will be forthcoming soon a um, very complete paper on wince and anti-wince. Um, Chris has promised me that it's just about ready. Is it after the past two years? Is he just, just, <laughs> <laughs> he promised that last year, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, Seb Seb Sebastian's here, he's going to make sure it happens. That's not ready. <laughs> so, so uh, however, this would be just a little, uh, this is a little bit to tempt you here, uh, that there are lots of winds expressed, and generally the picture could be is that there's lots of posterior expression of winds, uh, and that wind antagonists are sort of general anterior expression of them here. So this would be SFRP15, about which you've heard uh, several times before, up here uh, in the ectoderm early on, um, narrowing down to a little spot here. And um, I won't go out because that's all going to be in the paper of the peers. And let's see, uh, this is something from Sebastian's uh, paper, that just to pick up on this. That something like SFRP15, if you were asking about how does it get expressed up there anteriorly, it would seem to be that it's some kind of intrinsic expression to uh, these parts, these cells of this part of the embryo that has not really got uh, subjected to signals from this more, from the vegetable and these regions down here. So that, for example, if the embryo is cut there, uh, like that, and tested, or if it's treated in some way with beta catena siRNA, just knock out endomesoderm formation, then you get these balls of cells which express SFRP everywhere. It just seems to be intrinsic to those anterior cells. It doesn't need an organizer to put it there. <laughs> it's just coming up there anyway. Um, and that's also true, I think, of SFRP34. Is that right, Sebastian? And then also a... I don't take that thing. Yeah. We'll predict it. <laughs> okay. So if you take if you take these various things, um, we have all of this 
ectodermal, early ectodermal expression <coughs> we've talked about here. <coughs> we have this kind of ectodermal SFRP expression up here. And um, Chris has followed also the DKK expression that comes up a little later, some of it very anteriorly. I don't know whether, is that also intrinsic to, to uh, anterior cells? Yeah, we have a look. Have a look. Let's say it is. Yes. <laughs> okay. Whereas winds are down here more posteriorly, so we have sort of a, a wind anti wind opposition here. Um, and we don't have any sightedness showing up in it. We don't have so we don't have any sort of a dorsal uh, uh, asymmetry things to expression here. So we finish here with uh, signaling molecules. And if we go to all these transcription factors, so I mentioned uh, if you're getting into particularly brachiuri that would be expressed in the trunk tail organizer region of the organizer at very high levels, whereas it expressed at lower levels elsewhere around the rim of the blastopore. Uh, what do we have in uh, cyclops as well as we've heard in various other presentations? So it's showing up around the blastopore position here. This would be the vegetable plate in here. Uh, then later, it's, it's still down in here, both in endomesoderm and the tip, the tips of ectoderm there. Continuing on here, there's a, a brief moment around the mouth that shows up. There's no time, though, when you see some sort of midline uh, expression of brachiuri here. So there's nothing in there like that. And then here we are at the end after the mouth expression is done. Um, so there's nothing that looks like a really horrible being uh, brachial expression here. Uh, what about Fox A? Actually, this is one of the nice things Mark was mentioning, the single cell transcriptomics. Uh, so uh, he and Leon and I went quickly through some organizer genes there. And uh, it's wonderful to look through. You sort of find that in sort of the, what I thought to be sort of organizer specific regions there. So Fox A is, shows up really strongly in the in those organized regions here. Here it's expressed through the whole vegetable plate. The vegetable ends up in a lot of endometrium as Stephen showed and then dies back in here. There's a little, again, brief expression in the mouth and then all through them here. Uh, so very different. We're not getting some side, real sightedness there. Uh, not is also sort of generally expressed and then kind of fades there. We don't have sightedness. Uh, but we do have things that are down in a lot of things showing up in this endoesoderm region. And this goes on, uh, OTX a lot there, uh, goose koi all over the place down here, no sign of this. Uh, this LHX15 is at first not expressed in endoesoderm at all, it's ectodermal, here beautifully ectodermal down there. Um, so we don't have these genes clustered in one. Um, region. Um, what do we have? This is this H hex, which does have some interesting dorsal ventral difference. This is the this dorsal endomesoderm here. And then sort of receding posteriorly, but still up here and it's most anterior and extending into this into this um uh, region up in here. Uh, in vertebrates, this is, as I said, this was in this region that it had been reverse uh, discovered and was working with. And then normally ends up over on the ventral side of the embryo and is thought to have some role in hematopoietic expressions then later in this H hex. So it's unclear what to make of this up here, but that's the one thing that does have some asymmetry. Here's limp, <coughs> again, sort of very widely expressed and not something that talk about a dorsal lip. So when you when you do all of this and you take all the the various genes, you get this you get sort of overwhelmed with the way things are scattered around. This is one rendition. So let's say we have sort of this uh, early stage we're getting right up the gastrulation here and we have our, our vegetable plate here. Uh, you have a lot of these organizer genes just expressed throughout this region. And what's the difference? Well, as you get over then into into um, 
vertebrates and talk about the quadrant uh, about dorsal lip. It's as if a lot of those things just got confined in their expression to sort of one region over here. Whereas they are, they're down there, they're just not dorsalized here. They're just not all expressed over this one region. But it's not that they're all that far away, they're just spread out. So let's see, uh, the last thing, well we have two things, we want to look a little at the um, <coughs> repeat looking at the stone cord region and a little repeat just to talk about morphogenesis and uh, then I think we were finished with this. So <clears throat> no, no cord life genes in the stone cord region. Uh, we've struck out on just about everything here. Uh, we talked about brachiary. Um, there is a little bit of OTX expression up in the front here as well as a lot in the ectoderm here. Um, Fox A is actually not being expressed up in here. Uh, hex we've already talked about, but that's not usually associated with the, um, uh, the notochord portion of the organism anyway. Uh, Fox E is an interesting one that is expressed quite strongly up in here. We followed it a little later and looked at it from this dorsal view. I'm wondering if it's associated with the proboscis skeleton formation. Here, you can sort of tune a, a nice fork poking through the neck here, like that. Um, DNBX is sort of up here in an interesting region, but it's a little, see it's a little back from the, from the um, <coughs> stomach cord itself, but it is probably up there in sort of an important gene of this <coughs> collar pharynx region. Um, hedgehog, has this been published anywhere, Chris, or is this a, I don't think so. No. You're seeing it here. Where's <laughs> <laughs> my phone? Isn't that beautiful? So that's, that's pharyngeal expression. It's all the way around. It's not that it's on one side here. It's all the way around. That would be where the gill slit is going to form up. And it's poking up into the stomach cord region there. We don't have a dorsal ventral difference here. Uh, this is one that is sort of interesting just looking at things going on in this region here. I stumbled across a mucin related gene which is expressed here in this ventral midline endoderm as a sort of a mucin like gene which for uh, we don't know anything about endostyle i think we already talked a little bit about endostyle and sort of our shortage of information about it uh, this is the sort of thing let's say with the single cell genomics you know if you have a, if you have a marker like this and then you can find those cells then you can find what else is expressed there and see whether we're on to something interesting there. But anyway, uh, we're not talking about notochords there, and we're not talking about you know, we're, we're far away from the, the stomach cord. Uh, collagen 5 has beautiful expression up in there, but I don't know how to connect it to anything there. There's AL ALX up here in mesoderm. Um, here's one that Anacidians was a favorite notochord gene, this leprechaun, which is a, a proleal 3 hydroxylase, not proleal 4, but a 3, which is sort of unusual. It's expressed in the city of notochord uh, quite strongly. It's all over, all over the endoderm here. Finally, it shrinks away and there's a last little bit left up here. It doesn't actually seem to be right in the stone cord itself, but you have all these things that sort of sound is that they have possibilities, but they don't really have the right pattern. And um, I don't think we have anything that we could say is suggestive to record to us. Literature that Sears and Gastrulation has been studied, where there's a lot of uh, uh, Jeff Harden studied that with Ray Keller at one point about converging extension cell intercalation like activities of our interon cells during the period where it's sort of folding up and getting along. Uh, but that's uniform around the arc heteron. But there, it's as if there is a, an activity, a process there, but it's just not dorsalized here. It's just going on throughout the entire arc heteron. Then we come to the famous experiments of Chris Lowe and Stephen Green, where I noticed that Steve showed cutting off <coughs> the lower portion of the embryo and just allowing it to go through gastrulation movements on its own. It forms a nice sock going up there. So it looks like an arc Is that that's correct? 
one it is very correct, but one comment is that uh, it actually will be not very uniform if there's extra epidermal on one side. So one of the tricks to get them to look that way is to cut it very evenly. Uh, it's somewhat. So you do need to have some ectoderm? Uh, you do require a little bit of ectoderm on the side, certainly. But if there, uh, the, the lengthening won't be uniform if there's more ectoderm on one side than the other. I see. Okay, so there might be some interaction there. Okay. Uh, well, this is for the future. <laughs> So at this point, we don't have anything about some sort of asymmetric um, um, morphogenetic activities as we do really with um, the core portion of the um, organizer with all of this convergent extension activity. Okay, so having struck out on almost all of those things, um, I'm sort of left with this conclusion that that sacroblossis, and this seems to be true for Tycothera too, you could say at least as far as organizer genes, they may have them all. Who knows they may have all these morphogenesis genes too. Uh, it's all in there, uh, and so these go way back to uh, present. Probably, you know, some of the major patterning process interactions of BMP, anti-BMPs, WINS, anti-WINS, and things, those patterning processes are in place and working there. Uh, but what's different is they're not arranged as they are in a vertebrate organizer being all concentrated over in one portion and then arranged uh, within that one portion and they more sort of spread out or things like the anti-wince just uh, intrinsically showing up in the anterior part of the embryo uh, without any kind of extra patterning here. So uh, thinking that all those things are available then sort of left in a position of well, to organize an organizer. These would all be things special to the coordinate line, if that's true. And what would have to be done? Well, you'd have to get a lot of these transcription factor domains limited down to one portion of that endomesodermal region without the blastopore. Um, Cord and ADMP may be down there at some place anyway, so you just have to couple all those up. Then Morphogenesis genes somehow get built up more in that portion. Um, wind antagonists brought in. Of course, there's a big thing like then for finally getting a notochord. All of those um, precursor properties would have to be brought in. And so it seems to me that there has to be sort of a massive reorganization. You've got all the genes, you've got, and they sort of express them time and place to get into your posterior dorsal ventral, but they're having to now get organized, reorganized here into a, um, a sector of the blastopore lip. And that's some kind of special event over there in the chordate line that we aren't seeing over here. So that's sort of what I'm uh, left with this this portion at this, at this time. And as you see, it, it's uh, it's sort of difficult to write up when one is left. This <laughs> portion <laughs> <laughs> is saying that coordinates are great for, for what they've done here, uh, but it would then require further steps of understanding what the coordinates really did over there. Anyway, we come, so uh, this is the conclusion here. <laughs> <laughs> That difference is due to the fact that Sacrobosa doesn't form a mag until much later, and much of the morphogenesis of, of larvae, early larvae, are about both forming the mag but also forming the ciliary bands that are feeding the mag as well. Mm -hmm. And so there's an inherent sort of delay in in what you need to do in Sacrobosa to what you need to do in other areas. Sounds like a good point. <laughs> <laughs> 
that, that uh, getting the larva developed, you're drawing on sort of your dorsal ventral differentiations earlier um, than we are in, in this direct developer. So you don't need to be dorsal ventral. There's, there's very little need for much of a differentiation early in the dorsal ventral axis because it's all about the adult and that happens more slowly. Yes. Um, well, there's also what, what you and observed, Chris, that in a lot of the anterior-posterior domains, they, they go all the way around the animal here. And I don't know if that's also true in, in Tychoderm. You mentioned some of those seem to be more ventral. Where is this? Uh, let's see. Well, if you take things like in Grail and so on, is that? Uh, is that called? Uh, but most of the things that Chris looked at early on as AP genes, there'd be a beautiful sort of ring, and then another ring, and then another ring, and another ring, some broader and some narrower. Um, Don't you think that's because the AP axis is determined by the animal visual axis? And that's the interesting thing in Amboy Prairie and both of them, that AP axis is already determined by that. Well, it's certainly totally animal related visual. to that, that's right. But if you look at the chordates, I, the AP axis and DD axis are sort of, they're coming together. Right. right. And I think that that's... And let's see, uh, I didn't really... Yeah, the, 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 I mean, there is already an AP axis. There is already an A, but the AP axis isn't. Uh, AP axis. Yeah, so, it's not, no, it's related, but it's not. Because, because the, 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 the dorsal side turns, turns yeah. around. But it, but you have, a, you have at least an axis to play off of. Yes. You know, I mean, you're not generating the axis. Well, it's an axis, but it's not. Let me show you axis. something on that right here. Thank you. Which one Thank here? you. Part of the problem here, yes. If you here's here's the animal pole, and right. a better way to draw this is if you have animal pole here and animal pole there. So you turn this thing now, imagine turning right. 90 yeah. degrees, and you see the blastopore is going to close finally way over here, not down here. This is all due to there, there's all this morphogenesis yeah, going on here, and pushing this way down so that this red stuff. If you sort of kept this thing in this position here, this red stuff would be pushing all the way around mm -hmm. there. So right. it's really sort of a reuse yeah, of all of these materials here. And as you say, we're not any longer just on the old animal vegetal right. egg axis. We've sort of done a lot of fancy things over here. Yeah, Mark? I'm trying to put this all together. In other words, on one level, you're saying that you can find all the genes. Right. Uh, and like some processes. So, so you know, something. we didn't, uh, yeah, so that, um, uh, now that all the genes are presumably there for a function. Yes. Uh, and so, uh, it would be good to know in every case um, what that function is. So, I mean, you know, maybe that function is, uh, if it, if it's, if it's involved in the, in the patterning and morphogenesis, as some of them certainly are, then, um, then we have to somehow integrate that information. And again, if, it's, if, it's, if they're there, maybe they're going to serve some other function later, maybe they should serve a, a local differentiation function, who knows what their function is. And we can sort of take them out of the equation, at least initially. So that, so, I mean, I in a way, we kind of, um, have bombarded with a huge number of, of genes, all of them, so many of them in the wrong place, right. and try to explain this, the story from that point of view. So the other thing is, uh, we do know some of these function, and in fact, the signaling centers function. Um, so uh, we have this BMP, anti-BMP axis, which seems the most you know, beautiful of all. I mean, yes. it, it, it behaves almost exactly like uh, you'd expect in, 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 in chordates. Right. Um, I could comment there while, while you're mentioning it. And what we don't know here is, let's say, how the 
the VMP gets up on, on deadline and how the cord gets up the midline. Whereas we know in invertebrates that say cordon is being really brought in the course of the morphogenesis, you know, that we're getting this so stretch out thanks to the organisms here. But yeah. here, here it's so well, we don't have much in the way of you know, I first say the organizer is He's got to do a lot of things. If, uh, one of the things that does play uh, in, in including that kind of role here is in cell migration. I mean, the kind of morphogenesis is pathetic in this organism. I mean, it kind of folds in gastrulation. We don't want to have to try to explain that. This is certainly not happening. But what is happening is uh, is uh, asymmetry, the important asymmetry of the dorsal ventral asymmetry. Whether uh, you're right, we don't know how to get good place there, but we. But the other things that are going on here, since we work, uh, you know, in, in Crystal Lab, and, and um, is is really that the the lint signaling centers are really functioning as signaling centers. They're not just being left scattered around the embryo, and they're giving us, uh, I guess, at least in part of an anterior posterior signaling. Which again is not all that different from what is a yeah, treatment right. place. That's right. That's right. So, um, uh, so I guess the question is, uh, you know, uh, can you build an organizer conceptually out of the functioning pieces that you have? Right. And I think the one thing that um, we talked about before. Uh, a couple of things that you have to do to make this happen. Um, one is you want to move these sibling centers together, maybe, in, in, maybe ideally in, in, in the same cell, and, you know, uh, which where they've been scattered around. Uh, secondly, and there's also the, the whole gastrulation thing, which is which which uh, should be happening. The one thing that should be happening in a circle, more or less, here. Um, you know, that is a better set of, of, of symbols. So we should be able to, uh, so clearly we need to uh, have the cells moving, and that doesn't exist. The sibling centers have to be brought together in the same place, which they're not. Um, I mean, if you try to work from that direction, yes. given what we know about active sibling centers, what is and is not happening in this animal. Um, can we come to a, uh, a, a proposal for a path that will generate the organizer that way? I, I think you could. I mean, of course, if you sit down and start uh, making things up. Why not imagine anything? There's also an old idea which um, sort of uh, I sort of see behind all this. The idea of the organizer was a way to deal with large eggs. As Billy was saying, yeah. when you have these smaller eggs where you have sort of animal and vegetable, it's all still within reach here. And you get to something getting up to large amphibian eggs, uh, large fish eggs, and then large, um, well, by the time you get to uh, amniotes, huge eggs, the chance of having your animal pole and vegetable stuff ever interacting through that. So it's as if all the good stuff was taken and brought into a smaller area. Of which then you could generate the AP, EV on some portion of what was the great big egg cell. Yeah, so you know for sure that the, that the early vertebrate uh, embryos had small or large eggs. I mean, if you look at something like Amphioxus, that's what you were saying. With Amphioxus, it's a little different because it's a small, it's a smaller egg. Are there any giant amphioxus eggs? Yeah, there's a little Yeah. I'm imagining that I mean you have this two pathway for AP, so with wind and DV with BNP coding, and uh, roughly independent of sarcoidosis. So as far as we know, I mean they work independently. Right. But this still exist. And the main difference I get for a vertebrate organizer is the fact that they, I mean, the coded organizer. They work together. And I know from vertebrate works, what do we know about, let's say, cis regulation of this uh, organizer gene that 
uh, I guess there are some of these like, I don't know, Cordin or Gusco, it were get input from both Sprint nodal pathway or BMP pathway. So can we explain somewhat, let's say, uh, at the level of cis related DNA that some genes will be now controlled by the two pattern pathways? Well, we could, and then, and then there, that's right, there are interactions pathways. Uh, that's, uh, as far as I know, you know, unless there's been some interpretation, that's not really explored that much. It's known to be a problem according to the set right? There's more interaction. Mm -hmm. so, so. Yeah, the nodal gene and cording gene and ADMP gene, they co-express an eventual activist. And he claimed that that's the organizer of the urgent. Yeah. So he can you know, express this all this signal on the other side and showing that two axes. So I was wondering if we think about um, either suckability so tachyderma, you see nodal expression in the vegetable ring and cordial expression on the ventral side and also ADMP on the ventral side. So they co-localize on this vegetal uh, ventral lift. So I was wondering, has anybody done tissue graphing in suckability? Cut out this piece and put it. That was the last thing I was trying to do experimentally. Uh, was, mm -hmm. yeah. uh, let's see, there were two parts to it. One was sort of correlating the sperm entrance point, which you can stand up in various ways. It seemed to be a pretty reliably what was going to be the BNP side. Mm -hmm. um, and then I tried. This is true in frog. This is true in yeah. frog, right. And then I tried small things like getting up toward the gas for stage and making sort of prediction where the BMP means you'd be and cutting that out just by itself. And indeed you get something that it, it looked as if it was sort of a BMP knockdown and you know, came out of it, which you kind of expect. I guess that would only say that if you get rid of that BMP region, there's nothing else in there that can sort of generate BMP in the absence of that. <laughs> I, I, it's enough that right I, into another embryo. And I didn't do the actual graph, no, it's more, it was just a review. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be for the future. <laughs> uh, another thing to try and marry the two different species of, of the indirect developers and direct developers is that from what Paul was showing in his project, when you don't have a trunk in the larva, your expectations of organizers can be different because you're maybe just looking at a head organizer rather than a, a trunk organizer. So there, there may be some tiny differences and some, some ligand differences simply in the fact that you don't need a trunk organizer because you don't have a trunk until much later as well. So that, that there may be some interesting things to be explained between the two systems simply on the basis of a missing trunk, right? Again, in the fraud, you can distinguish between the trunk organizer and the, and the head organizer. Um, so, uh, I here, I mean, if you knock out this kid, is there, is, is there any of the knockouts that you guys have done that, that really will allow the interior organization without the body of the trunk organization? Is there it's not surgical, but painful. Well, you, you have experiments where <clears throat> if you underexpress winds, you sort of have the anterior portion expanded backwards. Is there something with the, can you get something that is basically lacking what would be the trunk portion? So yeah, if you, if you entirely knock out uh, nodal, then you lose all trunk. Whereas if you, no matter how hard you push down wind signaling, you always have a rudimentary trunk. So you need nodal, which we think turns on winds, which right. then posteriorizes. But nodal seems to be the, from what, Sebastian, correct me if I'm wrong, if you think that I'm wrong on that one, um, that nodal seems to be the sort of earliest ligand that then sets everything up. And without nodal, you just have a completely anteriorized. Okay. And then well, no, with no gas really. Oh no, the gastrites. The mm -hmm. gastrites, yeah. And is this anteriorized where it's just sort of um, proboscis? Yeah, yeah, they cut that thing with that. Yeah. So it's not gastrite. Yeah. I guess further thinking of sort of the separation of all these functions, and they just have to be interdependent. 
Thank you very much.